In this video, we will explore how color vision works with one, two, or three cones. In other words, how humans and other creatures see the world. This is part six in our series about color vision. This is our view of the world, fully detailed and richly colored. It is a product of our trichromatic, or three color vision, based on having three types of color sensing cones. But if you were a dog, you would likely see the same scene like this, because you have only two types of cones. This is the normal vision for most land mammals. With only one cone, it would look like this. This is normal vision for most marine mammals. This diagram shows how the different groups of vertebrate animals vary in which cones they have. From that information, we can make a pretty good guess about how the world looks through their eyes. To get you oriented, here is a quick review of how color vision works. Light from the outside world is focused by the cornea and lens. Within the eye, the retina is the part that senses light with specialized cells called rods and cones, so named for their particular shapes. As one of these photoreceptors receives the light, that triggers a nerve impulse that is sent along the optic nerve back to the brain. In the previous videos, we have covered the details of how rods and cones function. In both types of photoreceptors, the light detecting structure has two parts. Retinal is the molecule that absorbs the photon of light. It is derived from vitamin A. The retinal molecule is embedded in an opsin protein, and it is differences in the opsin molecule that determine the color of light each photoreceptor is sensitive to. Just so we are clear, incoming light is absorbed by the retinal, which causes the opsin to trigger a cascade of events that results in the sending of a nerve impulse announcing the arrival of a photon of light. Rods and cones are different in a number of ways in addition to shape, the most important of which is that Cones function in bright light and give us our color vision. In dim light, rods give us grayscale vision like this. They do not contribute to color vision in daylight. Here is the complement of photoreceptors that we have, with each of the cones shown by the colors they are named for. A more accurate way to look at the cones is by the part of the spectrum that each is most sensitive to. The naming convention works like this. Blue light has a short wavelength, so these are called either blue cones or S cones. Here is the peak of rod sensitivity, but again, they don't contribute to color vision. The green sensing cone operates in the middle wavelength, so it is called an M cone. Toward the red end, this cone senses longer wavelength light, so it is called an L cone. Here is the range of opsin pigments that are thought to have been present at the beginning of the vertebrate line. Four opsins for color and one for rods. The additional opsin senses in the ultraviolet range. In case you are wondering, cones developed long before rods. As vertebrate lines diverged, each branch utilized these resources in different ways. Now, let us investigate what the world looks like with different numbers of cones. Here again is our standard complement of cone pigments. Let's be really basic and start by asking, what if you had no cones? In humans, there is a rare condition in which a person has only rods and no cones. The term for this is a rod monochromat, one color. This results in grayscale vision like this in dim light. You may remember that there are only cones in the fovea, the very center of the retina that supplies fine detail vision. So without cones, the detail part of central vision is missing. Also, they lack the ability to hold steady fixation. Both of these factors directly result in poor acuity, which I have attempted to show here. Also, someone with only rod vision can't function well in bright light because the rods are bleached out. Somewhat like this, maybe worse. They only function in dim light. There are some animals, however, in which this is their standard condition. In what environment might this occur? 
Deep underwater, about a thousand meters, is the deepest that light from the surface penetrates. Below that, all is essentially darkness. Fish, which live at great depth, besides having rather exotic appearance, make multiple visual adaptations to this environment. For example, the use of only the more sensitive rods. Also, the photoreceptors are larger, with more pigment per cell, and a shift in absorbance to a shorter wavelength to better match the available light. What if you had only one type of cone? You would be called a cone monochromat. What color do you think you would see? Trick question. Whichever cone you have, the term color doesn't have much meaning in this situation. You would only be able to tell differences in brightness. That means you would see the world in grayscale, like a black and white TV. In humans, being a cone monochromat occurs as a rare condition. There are two varieties. If either the L or M cones are functioning, then vision is grayscale with relatively good acuity. However, if only the blue cones are functioning, then that's less good. Why? This shows the concept of the mosaic of cones in the fovea. You will notice that there are no blue or S cones in the center of the fovea, only red and green ones. If you have either red or green cones, you have some foveal function and acuity can be relatively good. But if you have only blue cones, then like a rod monochromat, there are no cones in the fovea and visual detail is poor. Maybe a little better than a rod monochromat. There are animals for which being a cone monochromat is the standard. Among mammals, owl monkeys, which are nocturnal, have only one cone, sensing in the middle to long wavelength range. It is interesting that they have the gene for the S opsin, but it is mutated and not useful. So in the past, they had the ability for a second cone, but lost it. Why would such a thing happen? One thought is that, since they are active at night, the rods are more important, needing only occasional help from the cones. Interestingly, the loss of blue cones has occurred not only in owl monkeys, but in several species, including the next examples. Many marine mammals, including whales, dolphins, and seals, have only one cone. Like the owl monkeys, these animals also have the gene for an S opsin, but it, it is mutated and not used. The functioning cone is classed as an L cone. Note that the shark, while not a mammal, also has only one long wavelength cone. I have left these pictures in color to raise the following question. In an ocean environment with increasingly blue color with depth, why exactly have the blue cones been lost? So far, the reason for that is a puzzle. What if you had two types of cones? This person is a dichromat, two colors. As an example, say the red cone is missing, the blue and green ones are working fine. Then he or she is called a protonope. Missing the red cone means all the color information comes from the blue and green cones. In the simple cone color model, you might expect the resulting vision to be a palette of blue and green, somewhat like this. However, it doesn't end up that way. The final vision is more like this. Because of the color opponent process, color information is separated into red-green and blue-yellow channels. In this case, the result is a blue-yellow palette. For humans, two-cone vision is a deficit. But for many animals, this is their standard vision. For example, fish that live at middle depths, reptiles, and most mammals. This table shows the cone complement from various orders of mammals, almost all of which have two cone types. Mice and rats have cone pigments that work in the ultraviolet and middle ranges. Mice have an additional interesting feature. The majority of cones express both opsins. Yes, UV and M pigments are expressed in the same cell. That should make color distinction difficult. And the reason for that is unclear. By far the most common combination of opsins among mammals is to have both S and L pigments. This includes dogs and cats, as well as pigs, cows, horses, and elephants. So their vision is like this, which we showed before. 
This is a good time to bring up another interesting question. Humans can describe what they see, but how do you get animals to tell you about color? One way is behavioral. In a friendly and cooperative species like monkeys or dogs, tests can be set up so that responses to different color choices end up with a tasty reward. The other way is analytical, physically measuring the absorbance of photopigments in the retina. For example, here is the setup for Knights's testing of color vision in dogs. In this experiment, the subjects were two greyhounds and the toy poodle shown in the picture. In front of the dog, there are three lighted panels. At first, the panels were the same achromatic white. Then an increment of colored light was added to one of the white lights. The dog was asked to choose the non-matching panel by nudging it with his nose. A correct choice rewarded him with a meat and cheese snack. After a bit of training, the dogs turned out to be quite good at this. Testing was done over the range of spectral colors to determine how well the dog could distinguish each color as different from white. It turns out, as shown by the graph, dogs are quite good at identifying colors over most of the spectrum. From this information, color researchers could estimate the sensitivities of the cone pigments. In this case, they estimated one long wavelength cone at 555 nanometers and one short wavelength cone at about 430 nanometers. Now, note the dip in sensitivity at 480 nanometers. Color in this region, which appears cyan to us, dogs have trouble telling it apart from white light. This is called a neutral point. Here is its location in the color spectrum. It is a product of dichromatic vision. At this point, S and L cones are equally stimulated, so there's no sensation of bluer or yellower. Remember from before, the blue-yellow palette is from the blue-yellow opponent color system. This spectrum is the same result as a human lacking a green cone and very close to one lacking a red cone. These people are said to be red-green colorblind. An example of a physical measurement of cone sensitivity is spectrophotometry. It is simple in principle. You can take a piece of retina, a very small piece, small enough so you can shine a light of known composition through an individual cone cell. Measuring the light coming through the other side shows which wavelengths are absorbed. Here is the result of just such a test done by Baumaker in England in 1980. This is from a human retina showing the absorbance for rods at the top, and below that are the three different types of cones. Here is a closer look at the result from a green cone. When the results from multiple cones are averaged, here is the result showing the peaks and ranges of cone sensitivities. So now you have seen two ways of measuring photoreceptor sensitivity. We were just comparing dogs with two cone types and humans with three cone types. In this diagram, I'm showing primates with three cone types, but that's an oversimplification. Primates have so much variability that they have earned a separate video of their own. For now, on to the three cone types. With three cones, we get a trichromatic or three color palette. As humans, this is our world. As I said in the beginning, richly colored. Another way to appreciate this is by considering the extra colors we get in the spectrum. Among mammals, this three color vision is limited to just some of the primates. But there are other animals that have three color vision. For example, fish that live in shallow water where there's a lot of light. Most insects also have three color vision, but theirs is based on ultraviolet, blue, and green. Only a couple families have a red pigment. For animals to develop and sustain multicolor vision, there must be some advantage. What might that look like? As an example, here is a Rousseau painting with the colors adjusted showing the world roughly as a typical mammal, a dichromat would see it. One thing to understand about primates is that a large part of their diet consists of fruit. Ripe fruit is better. But in this view, how can you tell ripe versus unripe? Everything looks the same. Here is the three color view. The advantage of the third pigment is strikingly apparent. 
the ability to find the color red or orange indicating ripe leaves and fruit. This review by B.C. Reagan on fruit, foliage, and color vision covers in great detail the work done investigating primate dietary choices relative to leaf and fruit color. In the end, they also discuss that the ability to find ripe fruit actually works to the mutual advantage of both the animals for food and the plants for seed dispersal. And why stop at three cone colors? Here again is our table of vertebrate animals showing some fish and a large number of birds have four cone pigments. This makes it possible in theory to have tetrachromatic vision. In humans, this may occur in some women. This is an advanced subject, but I will make a brief explanation for those who are interested. In humans, there is considerable variation in the M and L pigments. Because women have two X chromosomes, one of which is randomly inactivated, the foveal mosaic may have four cone types. However, it remains unclear if there is the neural processing machinery necessary to take advantage of the extra information. In animals, a number of fish and bird species have been found to have four or more opsin types. A few species have actually been tested and have been shown to have functional four-color vision. The proven winners are goldfish, chickens, and pigeons. I'm going to close with a lead into the next video. If you are at all a fan of biology, the details of how color vision is structured in primates leads to a very interesting story. Primates fall into two broad groups named for their geographic origin. Old world, those in Africa and Asia, for example, apes and humans, and new world, those in Central and South America, for example, squirrel monkeys and marmosets. Here is the situation we are faced with. One, most mammals, as we have said, have two color vision. Most primates in the old world, female and male, have three color vision. But primates in the new world have a different arrangement. Two thirds of females have three color vision. One third of females and all males have two color vision. That is not all. There are several long wave pigments to choose from, making their vision, quote, polychromatic, unquote. How to explain all of that? It is a fascinating story, and it is the subject of our next video. Here are selected references if you want to read more about color vision with different numbers of cones.